Hi, I'm Kenny Bastani. I'm a Spring Developer Advocate at Pivotal. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I wrote a book called Cloud Native Java, which is all about building microservices uh, using Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, and Cloud Foundry. All right. Um, hi, I am Cornelia Davis. I also work for, for Pivotal, have been working on Cloud Foundry for about five years almost. Um, and I have not written a book as in past tense, but I'm writing one now um, called Cloud Native, um, which covers apps, data, and what I call the Cloud Native Collective, um, which is bringing it all together. And uh, been working with customers and partners on Cloud Foundry for, for some time. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Ed Anna. Uh, I'm a uh, head of product at Apogee, which is now part of Google. Um, I've been involved um, with uh, Cloud Foundry for several years now um, with, uh, with Apogee's integration uh, uh, with Cloud Foundry. Um, uh, I did write a book. It was, uh, since we're talking about books, it was uh, uh, 20 years ago, um, uh, the Java Source book, um, first book on Java programming. Don't read it. It's horribly out of date and full of errors. <laughs> My name is Alex Williams. I'm the founder and editor in chief of the Blue Staff, and we're a technology publication. We publish books, and we can, <laughs> so we've uh, published books on uh, Kubernetes. We're about to publish a book series on the Kubernetes ecosystem. We cover Docker containers, and we publish every day on the side of the news stories and such. So, we just got that right now. Okay, thank you. And um, romantic writing, which is a great social experiment, one that shareholders are both comfortable and uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, without further ado, um, well, the first set of questions I have is kind of in terms of navigating the microservices stack using air quotes. Um, if you sort of look at things from the traditional, more air quotes, plan stack or three tier uh, web architecture and think about you know what carries forward, what doesn't carry forward, and maybe use this as a point of compare and contrast in order to understand that that was a sort of Well, it's, it's definitely a starting point that a lot of people are coming to. So a lot of the API um, activity, probably for, for many of the folks in this room, um, was about uh, moving to sort of a, a new front end, usually mobile apps, um, but, but also you know people rebuilding their presentations here with JavaScript and simple page apps and what have you. And, uh, and so you know for a lot of application developers, um, uh, they're, they're sort of first foray into building APIs uh, was was related to that. Was related to sort of moving from from a you know page centric architecture to something that was was going to power front end. Um, and then microservices now is is there's a lot of overlap with that, but there's also a lot of different. Anyone else on the panel have thoughts about kind of where the API front end or or where the API team is placed? <laughs> Cloud native um, deathmatch. All right, I'm going to ask for another next one about uh, the data tier. Is it always there? Um, how do we think about the data tier differently? That's kind of a big question. Yeah, and so it's interesting that you start with the LAMP stack because we've we've always kind of tiered things and we've always broken things apart, and it's and that hasn't changed too too radically in terms of this from a philosophical and from a from an idealistic standpoint the fact that we have our business tier and then we've got our storage and our persistence tier, um, except that in the LAMP stack. Um, there were a couple of things that were very different. In the LAMP stack, we might have had some level of distributed um, nodes in, the, in, in, in any of those layers, particularly the business layer, you know, so the application server layer. But it was not on the order of magnitude that we have now. So we might have had two or three nodes or maybe even half a dozen or a dozen nodes, but it was an order of magnitude that we could still kind of put in our heads. And we could still manage um, and it wasn't constantly changing. So we knew we had five, five servers in that layer and we networked them together a particular way and we tied them back to our data tier in a particular way. And having a more static and 
predetermined and not, not so frequently changing architecture in there allowed us to bleed some of the persistence and some of the data into the business tier. So that's one of the things that has markedly changed when we moved over into cloud native applications and microservices is that we started to say, well, don't allow that to bleed into that layer anymore. So we have to be much more strict when we talk about stateless microservices. We're much more strict than we were before on, no, truly, there should be no state in there. So that's one of the things that changes when we move from, from a LAMP stack into the microservices, that we have to be a little bit more strict about that. And that's where I, everybody here is at the Cloud Foundry Summit. So you're all familiar with the service API. So the services, the service broker and that model, I sometimes, I don't even like to call it the service broker, I like to call it the service protocol, which is this, okay, I'm going to be explicit about where my, my, my data tier is and I'm going to create these services and I'm going to bind them to the applications. And that's where we've been with Cloud Foundry for about the last four years is that's kind of the level of thinking that we had was, yep, move data into its own separate tier, be super strict about it, Here's the service, services protocol to be able to allow you to do that binding, and that's where we were done. What's changing now is that we are realizing that we have to take now that, that data tier that we've largely left alone, aside from being more strict about making a, making a separation, but we've left it largely monolithic and largely not polyglot, largely no, heter, uh, homogeneous. And now we're moving into a world where the data tier, we're having to take what we did in the application tier and apply some of those same principles to the data tier. Start to break it apart. Start to break apart the monolith. Um, treat it as logically perhaps still as a single data thing, but implementation-wise and um, it's far more distributed. So it, the data tier has to change radically. We just haven't done a lot of that work yet. I wouldn't say it's entirely net new, but it's something that you need as a part of a microservice architecture. Now, service discovery has been around for a while. It's not entirely new, but you would need it if you're going to do microservices, right? To be able to find other services without having a configuration file that has all of the routes defined in there, and what happens when you spin up new containers, right? You need to know where those are located, so you need service discovery. And so that's the reason why we need these kinds of things. Uh, uh, pretty much. I mean, so there, there's a pent-up demand for um, something that is, is more lightweight, uh, cloud-native, uh, agile response to, to what we used to, to call service-oriented data architecture, and a lot of people want microservices to be that. And maybe they will be. Um, a lot of people are using the terminology in that way. For example, Netflix really uses the term in that way. Um, on the other hand, a lot of what you see right now where there's a very pressing need is, is for... for a mechanism for, for essentially, you know, decomposing your apps and being able to communicate between them, but it, it isn't it isn't an attempt to to reinvent some sort of architecture. What's interesting about that, though, is one of the things we always talk about, so we're going to start throwing chairs here soon. So this is good. Um, yes, I'm glad. it was. You were being intentionally provocative, and that was good. So one of the things that we talk about with microservices all the time, one of the big benefits, in fact, that people talk about usually first is autonomous, autonomous teams. And you just made the suggestion that that isn't, in fact, the way it's done most of the time. I think you said that the consumer and the, the it's the same team that's consuming and producing the API. Yeah. So it isn't about team autonomy. And you're, it, so is that something that you're seeing pragmatically? Well, what is it meant by team autonomy? What, what, I mean it, what I mean by that is that the, there's a, a team that's building a something, they're going to be a consumer of a microservice, and they are loosely coupled from the team that's over here. They are, they, they are not in lockstep. They do not have to have a Gantt chart that says, hey, I can't release version two of mine until you release version two of yours. It's, that's what I mean by autonomy. You're saying that's not necessarily the case. Well, what I'm saying is, is that you suddenly are going to move into an entirely different realm that microservices may or may not um, uh, protect you from, which is now you suddenly get into into uh, things like API description formats. You get into things like API versioning, um, and and a lot of that is typically not the hallmark of what people are talking about when they mean microservices. Um, again, this is a continuum. 
So just to, to not make it as provocative. So um, we solve a lot of that with Spring, like API versioning, for instance. And I like to think about each microservice as a GitHub project, right, or a Git project in general. Now, if you're a consumer of another service, you're going to uh, maybe make an issue against another repository. Um, now, for versioning of your API, you can use something called consumer-driven contracts with Spring Cloud Contract. Um, you would be able to contribute or make pull requests of your expectations of that service, and you can run tests against that when you go through your continu continuous delivery pipeline. So before you get into production, you have to pass those tests, and that allows that autonomy. That's going to prevent the breakage, but you're still going to end up having a big sideband governance model. I don't, I don't believe that Spring actually uh, completely solves that problem. Um, people have been using Spring uh, to, you know, which in, and Spring is a whole portfolio of things I won't debate with the pivotal folks as to <laughs> entire, entire um, uh, definition of that. Um, but when you start working with particularly clients that are outside of the Spring ecosystem, um, you are going to end up with a whole bunch of communications challenges that, again, are sideband to the code in terms of communicating to clients that versions have changed and so on. Maybe if you are all in on both sides. Excuse me. Um, sorry. Um, you know, assuming you've got, and, and again, this is one of the things we're seeing in microservices where you've got a common stack on both the calling side, uh, on, on, on the consumption side, and um, the provider side where you're able to, to start to deal with these things. But a lot of what people are trying to do is, is use these in very heterogeneous environments where they don't. Sure. I wonder, I, I love how Alex asked, asked the audience for um, a question, and I'd like to ask one here as well, is that when it comes to API versioning, my sense is that many of us don't really grok that particularly well, that we have a ways that we can go in understanding what we need to do in terms of API versioning. and the techniques that we're using, and even the value of it. And so my question to you is, would you agree with that statement that we, we could all learn a little bit more and maybe do a better job doing API versioning? Yeah, almost, yeah, more than half the folks, so. So for Spring Boot, which has been an incredibly successful project, uh, we have over 19 million downloads a month now. I really think it's two things, right? The first thing is packaging. So when you talk about a Spring Boot application, what really changes is that you're no longer shipping a war artifact to an application server. Your application is the application server. So that's the big difference. And that's fueling a lot of this microservice growth. The other thing is reuse and composability, right? You can go to start.spring.io and you have all of these ingredients you can choose to put together a recipe. And that recipe can be the prototype for your microservice. And then you can replicate that across your organization. You can standardize on components. And I think that's really fueling a lot of the success that we're seeing with microservices today. Can that help address the choice? Or does that actually make it more problem? So standardization is really important. So I've seen that across the board. When I started out uh, with microservices, I thought, yeah, every microservice should be able to choose the technology that they, they want to use to solve the problem at hand. But you really need to choose that technology across the board at your company. Otherwise, you're not really going to have specialists in the company that you can draw upon to solve certain problems. So you need to standardize at some point. So I've, I've thought the main problem is, for a while, legacy culture, right? I think there's a lot of people out there who just don't really want to change. And two, some people don't need to change. I mean, if you really need a microservice architecture because you want agility, you want to go faster, then go there. But you have to want to change, and you have to want to embrace the new technologies. Um, now, you're all here at this conference because of that. But you have to go back to your company, and you have to really spread that um, amongst your colleagues so that they get on board as well. I think that's the biggest blocker, is getting everybody on the same page. Yeah, I, I keep hearing this thing about time and like, speeding things up. And things are moving so far fast, it just seems kind of, it just doesn't seem really logical to me when you think about kind of like, you know, how fast actually things are moving, right? And how active these ecosystems actually are. And how, and how fast these open source communities are actually moving. And I don't know, if you guys have any thoughts on that, because I hear like it's, you know, you know things are still, you know, the market's still slow and everything else, but I don't, I don't really, I don't really buy it. Do you, do you guys? I definitely do. You know, to a certain extent, um, the the overall speed. Of, so 
we're in the middle of, of a, a platform renaissance and a framework renaissance and increasing choice and all the things we, we talked about. And thankfully, we're, we're only talking about you know things like microservices. If you talk to people off in the, in the JavaScript land, they've got a new framework every you know month to, to, yeah. to, to sign. Um, you know, they uh, the. This is all sort of, um, you know, paced by the actual, uh, you know, delivery of, of applications um, and adoption of those applications, which I think is, is the part that, that we forget about. So even though we can deliver the application faster, getting getting the users on it and building a life cycle and so on around that takes time. So a lot of the the um, apps that are be built, being built on these new platforms, um, you know, are, are still in there. Uh, even though they got delivered much faster, they're still out there. People are experiencing them. They're going through their own paces of revisions, and, and, and those are going to drive new requirements that, 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 you know, are going to be incorporated back into the platform. So I, I think, you know, that, that concept of pace layering, different things happening at, at different speeds very much applies. I think we all, very close to technology, are moving very quickly, but but it takes a while for it to propagate. Okay, sorry, I, I had to interrupt. Sorry. Okay, and maybe the right way to think about it is just it's the uh, the speed to value for the, the folks trying to get the value out of building and um, and breaking monoliths and building new microservices architectures, and they want to get the value out of that. And so, what's the thing that that needs to change? Uh, Kenny says it's it's not anything in technology; it's just people and culture that will help people get to that value faster, maybe reframe the question a little bit, but for the rest of the panel as well. Yeah, I mean, I, there's certainly what I've talked about earlier around figuring it out at the data tier um, is, is critically important. And there isn't a single person that I talk to about that who doesn't say, oh yeah, gosh, that remains, remains a huge problem for us. Um, I do want to just very quickly echo what Kenny said. I'm not sure if it's culture, but I think it's along the lines of what he was talking about. Just sitting here today is making me think when we had this conversation around, um, uh, what was it we were talking about where you chimed in? I have such a short-term memory. Um, but let me give you another example. So I was chatting with, with a group earlier this, this week, and we did some user interviews of developers. And they w one of the conclusions we reached was the developers are a lot more comfortable with synchronous um, APIs than they are with asynchronous APIs. And my fear was that we were reaching the conclusion that we were just going to stay with synchronous APIs, but that isn't going to work in this new model. So there is this notion of we've got the primitives um, we've got some primitives in Spring, in Spring Cloud or in Spring Boot and Spring. Do people know how to use those? Do people actually know how to leverage those? And we still have a ways to go to re-educate into what are the patterns that work in this highly distributed, constantly changing environment that is the cloud. Well, I, you know, I think that a piece of it is that um, it seems like we, we are we learning a lot of the lessons that start to happen as, as you widen the, the scope of reuse and you start dealing with sort of, so, you know, I, I think, you know, for some of the previous comments about, you know, it's company culture and so on, um, you know, the minute you start talking about services and you start talking about uh, it, it, reusing them and, and so on, you're, you're now dealing with an ecosystem of, of individual teams, different practices, different technologies, and um, and I don't think we've I, I I actually don't think we've made that much progress on that. I think that the people who are um, uh, being the most productive with microservices have done so by moving towards sort of a a, a more uh, you know homogenous culture and a more um, common uh, platform, um, which in many ways, you know, um, is great because it, it, it allows you to move a lot quicker. But I, I think that that as we start to sort of hit these boundaries, and some of these boundaries are, are when, what happen when you try to share services outside of the perimeter of your organization. But in some of these these organizations that are now adopting this, um, they're just vast, sprawling organizations of 40,000 developers, um, you know, who are, who are using a variety of different technologies. I think that's the I think that's the challenge point, um, and, and it's going to be where where a lot of these microservices projects suddenly uh, realize that that you know now it isn't that micro anymore. Now it's looking a, an awful lot like the old-fashioned service-oriented architecture projects of, of two decades ago. There, there's two things that that come to mind. One is that. Uh, you know, 
one thing that I heard this morning uh, said is that uh, when developers start uh, thinking about application development and you know, the managers start to think about application development and making the process faster, uh, that has an effect on the entire organization. Um, and, it, and it affects the behavior of the entire organization. And that seems to me a, uh, um, a shift that you have to be ready for. Uh, the, the, uh, the issue that seems to come when you start having these changes in application development and, and, and management, you know, the deployment and the management of those applications becomes uh, a new reality that is often difficult to understand. Um, there's different time dimensions, right? There's different ways that you might have done something manually before, but you just can't do it anymore. We're seeing kind of the, the, the avenue of serverless architectures, and it, that's, you know, it, it, it affects so much in terms of like, just thinking of how you monitor event based systems. And, you know, that, that, you know, that's complicated, that's, that's, that's very complicated, but it seems to me like the next step is to get the business involved. Like, much more, you know, so you can start having, you know, more analytics and have to represent the entire organization. Because if, the, because if the developer organization truly is impacting the, the overall organization, there has to be kind of a, a much more holistic uh, way of looking at it. Okay, well, despite my best efforts, there's actually, I think, at least like three of four are arriving at a, something on culture, people, education, all those changes. So I guess I failed. <laughs> but I really want to thank okay. everyone on the panel. I want to thank everyone who joined. I know we're a little bit over time. So Thank you, everyone, and you know, we'll continue the conversation. Thank you, Dermy. Thank you. Thank you.